Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Aaron, I'm glad to drag you along in another dark story. This one is is incredibly dark and twisted and horrific. Do you you know much about the story of Courtney Lake? I I, I think this is pretty new for you. It's pretty new. Um... I, I did um, a little bit of um, Googling about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I know very little. Okay, good, because uh, I think this will be a good way to get, to get through it, because the, the format of this episode is going to be quite a bit different. For one, the two of us are going to walk through and talk through the story of then 24-year-old Courtney Lake, who's been missing since June 7th, 2017. She's out of Newfoundland. Um, but... What's going to make this format different is we'll talk it out and go through it, but I'm also going to use a lot of excerpts of an interview I did with Courtney's mom, Lisa Lake. And this interview I I did, I think, about a year, maybe a year and a half ago with the plan of making it an episode. And there's just so much to this story and so many moving parts that the interview was, I think, like two and a half hours long. And there was just, yeah, there was just so much in it. But what was happening was anytime I try to put it together, I just never managed to get the, to get it together in a really effective way of telling the story simply because there's, there's so much to it as you'll hear. Mm -hmm. It'll end up, I'm sure this is going to be a a two-parter. So as we go through it here, I'm going to use clips from my interview with, uh, with Courtney's mom, Lisa Lake. So that's how we'll introduce her with a, a, short clip from that interview can you just tell me who you are and what you hope to gain by by sharing your family's tragedy publicly sure my name is lisa lake i'm courtney michelle lake's mother who's been missing and murdered since june 7th 2018 um 2017 sorry um I hope and pray that somebody may have seen or heard something. And please, God, it will never happen to another child. So that's Lisa Lake. Um, uh, the accent gives it away. The uh, from Newfoundland, and that's where this story takes place. And she also comes in with a lot of info. Just even in her introduction, she explains that her daughter is missing and murdered. As you'll hear when we when we get through the story, is um, this uh, at its essence is a missing person story, but police have announced their belief that she was murdered. And when we get to the circumstances of her disappearance, I think it's um, it'll become pretty obvious uh, what had happened. So, first step on the journey here is. We'll learn a little bit more about Courtney Lake rather than me explaining it to you or us uh, trying to guess her personality or whatnot. We'll go back to Lisa Lake for this. Uh, In my interview, the first thing we did was we probably spent a half hour, 45 minutes or so going through kind of Courtney's childhood and Lisa's memories of, of her daughter as a young girl. Courtney was my first child. She was born in February 93. Um, Myself and her father weren't married at the time. Two and a half years later, two years and ten months later, she had a little brother, Colin, who she absolutely adored. She was the first granddaughter for her father's side of the family. She was the first granddaughter or grandchild for my side of the family. So she was very loved, very spoiled, and she was the same way the day she met Missy. And now, could you tell me a bit about Courtney's childhood? Like, what kind of kid she was, what things she enjoyed doing? Like, was she rebellious or well-behaved? Um, she had three things that she never left home with it. Barney, Baby, and Ba. <laughs> Barney was the Barney doll. 
baby was the baby doll mom bought her the day after she was born, and her ba was her bottle. <laughs> so up until she started, well, when she went to kindergarten, we had to fight to take her nummy from her. But she went to school. You know, we were terrified her first day of school where she was so close to me and everything. But she she put put on a real show the day we brought her to school. You know, my fears were gone, and hers were dancing down the hall. I'm here, I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. And throughout adolescence, like as she went on to junior high, was she, was she always that way, like outgoing and social? She was very outgoing, very social. Um, we had a mass here for on Monday night. It was her birthday. So my sister Donna sent some messages to her friends and some according friends and family uh, and just got them to sum up in four or five lines. How you know Courtney? What do you think of Courtney and all this? And the kind of responses we got were, you know, make your heart swell. Mm -hmm. You know, she was a wonderful person to be around. She was so funny. She could always make you laugh. She was, you know, if you're ever in trouble or need stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, you got it and all this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Great. And now, Courtney is, is, seems well known uh, that she's uh, was f physically beautiful. I believe I, I read that she entered some beauty contests. Is that right? She did. She entered the Miss Newfoundland pageant. Um, she was first si a single parent in Newfoundland to be allowed uh, the opportunity to run in the pageant uh, because she was a single parent. Her and myself fought for that, and she was so proud of it when she got the call that day that she could enter the pageant. And the day that we, my family and her son Oliver went and watched her, to watch her up on that stage, she was beaming proud and so were we. She didn't get a placement in the pageant, but she sure as hell made us proud. So it sounds like, um, for the most part, a pretty typical kind of happy childhood upbringing and you know in newfoundland like not really a lot standing out at, at this point i guess in the story no. what are your thoughts so far on you know the type of person we just heard described yeah like i mean it, it sounds like she was living a, a pretty awesome life the beauty pageant story is pretty cool i thought that um being the first single parent allowed in a in a pageant like that miss newfoundland pageant was was pr a pretty awesome story to tell yeah that's that's really cool and that's uh that stuck with me she she went on to describe a lot more about that and it was uh yeah it's, it, that's a nice story and it's a cool thing to think mm -hmm. of it so what we just went through is a lot about you know ch childhood up to early adulthood so we're going to now start getting into courtney's adult life um and we're going to start by just like we heard uh, Lisa discuss the fact that, and we just mentioned the fact that Courtney has a young son named Oliver. Uh, we're going to start by discussing Courtney's relationship with Oliver's father, how she met him, and kind of how their their um, relationship evolved and ultimately mm -hmm. ended. Now, it, it's important to pay attention because this this man, his name is Jason Pike. He he plays into the story a lot, not only because he's Courtney's child's father and, you know, someone she had a relationship with, but he was actually one of the, the last people that that she was seen with. Okay. But also just when you hear the relationship described, it's um it's a very complicated one. So I'll let Lisa take over the storytelling in this part. To be honest with you now, he was just a raving lunatic from St. Lawrence. He had had some very disturbing charges when he before he met Courtney. And did you know they were dating before her pregnancy? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. He came to me, actually. I was in the hospital, and he came in, and I'm like, why are you here? Is there something wrong? And he started to cry. He said, Lisa Courtney's pregnant. I said, how could you do that? You're an older man, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway, I mean, all I thought from that point on was, oh, my God, I'm going to be an nanny. Mm -hmm. 
You know, and I, I welcomed Oliver right from day one, and I told her and Jason, I said, you know, I am overjoyed to be a grandmother, obviously, but whatever decision you make, I will back you 100%. Uh, 100%. Mm-hmm. They, they were together for some time after the birth of Oliver, is, is that right? Um, they were off and on for a while, and there was, there was a lot of uh, physical violence that went on there. And, okay. you know, like once I brought her to here, and she was back up for two days, uh, back up to his place. And then three days later, she called me again, and I went up to her three or four o'clock in the morning and got her. And I kind of, I would never turn my back on her, never. Mm. But I had to get mad with her, and I say, Courtney, if you go out there for one more night, I'm done with you. Mm. So anyway, she kind of took it hard, but I had to say on my ground, she never went back. And now after she split with Jason, she spent a bit of time with, with you. I'm, I'm assuming that um, becoming like a, even as a single parent, she would have had a lot of opportunity to socialize and meet oh, new people did. and new guys, yeah. of course. Can you, can you tell me, like, did she have much trouble uh, juggling the responsibility of motherhood with her social life? Well, when her and Jason broke up, she came to live with me in paradise. So she knew instant babysitter. So, I mean, that worked out wonderful. But then I made sure that she wasn't using me for that. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'd say, now you got to be home by a certain time because I have to do whatever. But, I mean, she'd come home and I'd probably just go for a drive. You know, mm-hmm. just just to get her home. And, yes, you do have responsibles and whatnot, right? Mm-hmm. So she was good like that. So that's this is already off to a kind of complicated start. Like mm-hmm. she, 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 we didn't go deep into it, but she mentioned even in passing, Lisa had said, you know, there was a lot of physical violence there. That's, you know, already that this is kind of this story's taken like a strange tur- turn. It's she was dating an older man. Yeah. They had a child. How old was he? This guy? I don't know for sure, but looking at his photos and video and video, because he was eventually in the news and stuff after her disappearance, uh, kind of like pleading for yeah. info. I'm guessing he's at, at least ten or fifteen years older than her. Like he looks like an like an older guy. I, I'm only guessing. Like if she, she was 24 when she disappeared, I was get, I guess he's probably getting towards 40. But that's just purely based on appearance. But there's no question that. You know, their relationship was, was a rocky one, and, but I don't think it's completely unusual or uncommon. Like, you, you hear stories of, of young people getting in these kinds of relationships, so it's, you know, I don't like the story, and I, I didn't like hearing her describe that, but I guess I could understand what was happening. You're right. You hear it a lot, and um, older older man, younger woman, some family members would look at it and be like, who is this guy? What's what's he? What are his intentions? And uh, you could be suspicious about that. But yeah, um, and what I what kind of I think was one of the more important parts of it too is describing after they broke up. I had specifically asked, like, was she, you know, like kind of like fighting for her freedom after the breakup? Like, often when you hear just someone, boy or girl, man or woman, who gets out of a relationship often they're kind of like ready to mingle, you know? And I was kind of asking her at the end, like what was, how was Courtney reacting to like single life? And Lisa had, it. you heard her explain, you know, she had a babysitter, but I had, you know, some ground rules about how late she could get out. It's the reason this part is important is because it was during this period that she met the next player in the story Uh, A while after her breakup with Jason Pike, she ended up with another guy named Philip Smith. Um, Also, her Lisa's introduction with the the way she'll describe Courtney's relationship with Philip Smith. Uh, Also, another relationship that just starts off in an unusual way. I had heard about him, I'd say, two weeks before the first meeting. 
and she was talking online to him and he worked in Muskrat Falls and he had his own house and he had a motorcycle and he had a truck and whatever. I said, Courtney, he really sounds like a nice fella. But the first word I said, I said, why is he saying so? And, oh, ma'am, stop it, will you? I said, all right, bye, I'll stop. So anyway, she said, I'll bring him over to meet you. She said, but don't embarrass me. I said, okay, I won't. So myself and Dan were sort of sitting out by the door one evening and sees this motorcycle coming. Here's her getting off the back and he getting off. I mean, he was a nice young fella for the first visit. But then after the first visit, it was just, we tolerated him for Courtney's sake. Mm -hmm. If you flew five planes, Philip flew 55. Mm -hmm. That's the way he was. And he, um, you know, he was working in Muskrat Falls. And uh, so anyway, he was home for two weeks and she stayed over most of two weeks with him, he and Oliver. And then he went back to work and let her stay over in the house. And I said, Courtney, like, he's crazy. He don't know who you are. So very, so very quickly after meeting Courtney, moved in with him? Yeah. Yeah, and her and Oliver. And as as far as you know, initially at least, how was Philip t- uh, with Oliver? Like, did it seem like did he just kind of adopt adapt the persona as like a family man? No, he uh, Oliver didn't like Philip. Mm-hmm. Like he brought toys over there from our place here, and when he'd come back again, he'd stay for the night. Where's your toys? Oh, I can't find it. I said, well, you had it when you left Nanny's and brought it over to Phillips. Oh, I think Philip put it in the garbage. I think he was kind of in a roundabout way telling me Philip was mean to him, but he didn't want to tell me. Philip wanted Courtney, but he didn't want the rest of her baggage, which was her son. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like uh, not the best start to a relationship. But the, the way she tells that story, I was really picturing that, you know, clearly in my mind. Oh yeah, yeah. What what did he do for work in Muskrat Falls? I don't know exactly what he did, but I, I my impression was it was like kind of like a labor type thing where mm-hmm. he would go away for a period of time and work. But yeah, a few weeks on, a few weeks off, kind of. Thing. Yeah, it was that kind of thing because it was the the way she had explained it. There is he was going to work for a couple of weeks and pretty much gave Courtney the keys to his house. Like, why don't you? Yeah, you know, she'd stay there and yeah, move in basically. And mm-hmm. they had only been dating a short amount of time, so. Again, a young romance burns bright. I, I can get how um, that kind of yeah. thing may seem normal, but having the house and the and the motorcycle and the f- probably more freedom when you have those types of items in your life, you know, like it's uh, it's exciting to be with somebody who has those things. Yeah, and. In her case, you know, with a young child at home and all this stuff, I I could see it being a. I could just see like a young guy, like meeting this young guy, Philip Smith, with you know some money and a house, and like I could see how appealing that that could be. Yeah. But as we'll hear, it's um, like already there's some hints of it. With Lisa was explaining, Courtney's child Oliver seemed to have thrown some red flags up about about Philip, but. Things are really going to get bad fast. Again, she moves in while he's gone for a few weeks. Once he gets back, you know, the trouble starts. Well, first when he came home after his two weeks in Muskrat Falls, I'd say he was home maybe four or five days. And I get the call one night on her cell phone and she's screeching on the phone. And I said, Courtney, what's wrong with you? Mom, come get me, come get me. I'm Courtney, there's a blinding snowstorm. Where are you? Come get me, come get me at Phillips. I said, okay. So myself and Danny, four or five o'clock in the morning, blinding snowstorm. We go over and here's her sitting there down the step, blinding snowstorm. He was after Kate Marie. And uh, so anyway, we take her back home. The next day I'd see her and she was still fooling around with Jason, the baby's father. Because when I'd see her going down the road, turn her right, I knew she was going with Jason. If she went up the the road to left, she was going with Philip. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I said to her one night she was leaving, I said, Courtney, you are going with Philip again. You know, I said, I can't believe it. What's it going to take for him to kill you? 
And she said, Mom, I got to tell you now what he says. And I said, what's that? He said, this is all again. If you comes and gets me from his place, you won the game. And if he gets me back to his place, he won the game. That's what he he swore by. Wow. Yeah. All right. So so very then, so troubling early on. Oh, very early on. Yeah. It, it may have started off weird, but it's already it's bad, and we're only a few weeks in. Yeah, I don't know what's going on between Philip and and. and and her mother like yeah lisa like yeah it seems like it's this is pure it seems purely dysfunctional already at this point where he's and that's kind of a thread that will go through their relationship is courtney's mom lisa and philip are really butting heads and it seems like he's it seems like philip's playing games with lisa and kind of using courtney as a pawn Mm -hmm. as we go through the story there you know this is gonna get it's already bad it's gonna get a lot worse um both between courtney and philip and between lisa and philip where this pretty much from the start is a dysfunctional relationship that you know dysfunctional is a a good word for it it's you'll hear as we go it's um this is a has the trappings of uh of a horror story definitely the way their relationship uh will play out mm-hmm. let's get to um like again already it's bad let's get to where it really starts to hit the fan and you know domestic violence becomes a part of their relationship big time okay april the 15th she had called us it was snowing um and 777 number came up on the phone which is our hospital number First thing you think when you see 777, oh, my God, who's dying or dead now? Mm-hmm. So I answered the phone. It was about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and she was crying. I said, Courtney, what is wrong with you? She said, Mom, come get me at the health science. I said, Courtney, what's wrong? And she hung up on me. So another blind and snowstorm. Off we go. And when we went, got over by the hospital, she was outside. I said, what's wrong? Do we need to go in the hospital? She took away her hand. Now, Jordan, I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating this. Right on the side of her temple, it wasn't the size of an egg. It was the size of a baseball. That he had pushed her out of the moving truck on the busiest road in in St. John's. And before that, he had punched her in the stomach. He had knuckle prints in, in her arm. So as I was driving away from the health science, I was calling 911, forget the police to come here. And when she sat down with the police officer, I looked at her. I said, now, Courtney, listen to me. I said, if you drop these charges, I'm going to goddamn kill you. I said that right in front of the cop to get the point across to her, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, no, oh, no, ma'am, I won't, I won't. But anyway, he went in and um, he got two days time served for assaulting her and contacting her and whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I believe after his arrest, he was ordered to stay away from her. Was there like a restraining order or something? I had a peace bond on it. Mm-hmm. So he had to stay away from me, uh, not to go with, uh, within 400 feet of my residence, stay away from any schooling or enjoyment that he knew I would be too. Um, what not. And when he, we were living on a, another street just down the road here then, and I knew too, when she would go up to the left, up by the mailboxes, I'd watch her from my back door. You could see his truck making turn, turning around in his black truck. She was getting in it and going out with him. Hmm. So that was tough to listen to. Yeah, and it's 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 the kind of thing that you hear a lot of, like mm-hmm. sadly, you know, yeah, sadly, like somebody is abusive, um, you know, domestic violence, and you think, how can you keep putting yourself in that situation? But that's the like you just see that all the time that they seem to always go back, and it's really hard to wrap your mind around, but. Yeah, um, well, 
we'll see in this in this story, Philip seems to really know how to pull Courtney back. And it's more than just, you know, the romantic relationship. That's what we're going to get into next. Um, so j- just to p- reset the story. So at this point, she hasn't been with him all that long. The relationship is completely dysfunctional. There's domestic violence, charges against him. Courtney's mother has a peace bond against him, which is just like – that's a bad sign. When your mom has a peace bond against him. So, yeah. So at, <laughs> stay, at, stay away from me. Yeah. So at this point, things are awful. And just as you said, like when I hear these stories, I often – like I don't – the psychology of why someone goes back to an abuser is way beyond me. But in this case, in specific, specifically in this case, there's another side to Courtney that Philip is able to manipulate and use to reel her in whenever he wants to. Lisa explained this and this is also you know tough to listen to. Courtney – she had issues with girls. Yes, mm-hmm. that's right. Um, so there was an issue with them over there. Philip called her here one night and said he had all kinds of cocaine or whatever for her. Like Courtney was past the marijuana stage. Mm-hmm. That was no good to her anymore, right? So he phoned her and said, uh, I have cocaine here for you. And she said, okay, come get me. Now she told me all this after. Mm-hmm. So when he got her over, he had no cane, cocaine for her. And I mean, you think about it. That's like putting a baby in a candy store, mm-hmm. right? So she got very volatile, and she bit the window out of his car. He called the police. Um, he had conditions for Courtney to stay away from him. I had conditions for him to stay away from us. So the police let her go that night on her own recognition. Mm -hmm. That was two nights after her birthday, the 14th of February. Jesus, two nights later, didn't I get a call from an RNC officer? I'm over at 22 Alice Drive. Courtney's here and she's not supposed to be here. I said, oh my Jesus, I'm going to kill her. (laughs) So anyway, myself and Dan went over and picked her up. They kept her in in, in the lockup that night. I had to go down the next morning and I signed a $1,000 shortage to get her home right but i mean any time that you know courtney's running low on drugs i mean it, like like i said it's like baby in a candy store and he was using that philip was using that against her yes as a way yeah. to control her yeah mm-hmm. yeah i think that gives another side to why she's going back and it also just it makes the story even that much darker to think of her not being able to resist uh, Mm -hmm. to resist this yeah it's such a vintage way for um, someone to be able to hold someone down manipulate them is is to kind of use addictions like that and Mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 really tough to to see someone that you care about go through that and feel you know the parents feeling powerless mm-hmm. you know watching their their child go through that and mm-hmm. just get sucked back into something that's just yeah damaging now so to get back to kind of the narrative of the story th- that was almost like a little aside so we could understand kind of why she was going back so often but at this point in the story we're at just after April in 2017 uh, Courtney and Philip aren't in communication anymore. There was the charges against him for the April 15th assault against her. Courtney's mom, Lisa, has the peace bond against him. So I'm sure there's still some communication going on, but for the most part, they're not in touch uh, and are separate. What ends up happening is Courtney begins dating another young man who we'll hear a little bit more about shortly. But even if you look on her Facebook page, which is still still there, she's posting pictures of her and her new boyfriend. I'm sure Philip knew all about it, and I'm sure Philip didn't like it one bit. Um, the abuse he was putting against Courtney early on was physical. What he's about to do now at this point in the story, 
I think this, I don't know exactly when this happened, but I think it was mid May uh, of 2017 that he did this. Um, they're not in connection with each other, but Philip will begin reaching out to Courtney's friends and family by sending um, compromising photos of her to them, which is, I can't imagine oh anyone who would God. do this. And you hear of this happening, but now we're going to hear a mother describe, you know, dealing with her daughter going through this. Well, her father phoned me for, well, actually, no, Dan got an email, a text message from him first. And Danny showed the phone to me and I said, like, what the bleep? So I went in and I woke her up, Courtney, and I, and I said, Courtney, what is this? You don't let do people do this to you. This is the very reason you don't let them. Then her brother phoned me. He said, Mom, do you realize what Philip is doing? And I said, well, I do now. He sent them to Courtney's brother. Oh. He sent them to her father. He sent them to Dan, her stepfather. He sent them to Courtney's uncle. He sent them to Courtney's step pop. So that's pretty awful. I've, I've, you hear about this kind of stuff happening on, you know, I've heard on TV or you hear someone charged with, you know, sextortion or in revenge porn, like that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. the person, like, this to me is painting the picture of Philip Smith as being this, like, desperate monster basically who's just um trying to get revenge on courtney for something i don't know if it's because she left him and got a new boyfriend or what but it's just um the thought of him doing that to her in that way with you know right to her like her uncle and all this stuff like that's that's just sick i think it's crazy. oh like, it's I, yeah i can't and, and imagine it. receiving the photo like <laughs> mm -hmm. like how did it, he send them how did he send the photos they were just text messages like or facebook messenger i think it was a mix of both he was just started sending it to you know all of her her brother you know her father that's just awful she must have been so embarrassed and mortified and probably felt pretty helpless like he had already beat her up and mm. You know, and it's like, this is, um, yeah. Why would he do this? Like, why, yeah. what does he have to gain from, people. from sending photos like that? Yeah. People do crazy stuff and it's just, um, the problem is the law is so slow to catch up. Like even if she at this point reported him, like, yeah, like he's already been, it's already been reported to the police, like the April 15th assault. You know, now he's he's doing this. And to be honest, it's um, it's going to continue to hit the fan. So what we're going to get into next is we're and I should set this up a bit is we're getting close to the events that immediately surround her disappearance. Uh, and this is all kind of happening at the same time. But what we're going to get to next is, um, I guess, the climax of the breakdown between Philip Smith and in Courtney Lake. That'll that'll take place on the fifth of June. Here's how Lisa explains it. Um, she had blocked his number on her cell phone, so he couldn't get through on it. He called my phone thirty three times, and he wasn't supposed to have no contact with me. Mm -hmm. And then he parked on the neck, not my street, but the next one behind it. Uh, Courtney had phoned the police to come uh, because Philip was phoning here and said he was coming over. So it's so only by the grace of God, the police officer showed up in, a, in an unmarried car in plain clothes. So any Courtney was sitting down here to the table, giving her a statement about him tormenting her and harassing her and everything, and not come in the door. And the police officer went down and opened the door. He said, get Courtney right now. And the police officer says, who are you? Philip, Philip Smith. He said, why? Who wants to know? Police officer said, you're under arrest. Hmm. Yeah. Um, he was arrested. He was sentenced two days time, sir. Hmm. 
and uh, for, you know, distributing pictures and phoning her so often and whatever. And uh, the judge pitied him, he said, you know, he was um, in the army or the reserves or whatever, and he had no, uh, no uh, police record. So he said, I'll give you a chance. Four o'clock, he walked at the church, and I, I got the, the, the court uh, docket, and it said he promised the judge, he said, right to the bottom of his heart, he said, I'll never have no contact with her. So as we just hear that, heard there, and Lisa didn't ex- explain kind of the, the details of the charges, but basically what he was arrested for and eventually got two days sentence for was um, the assault against Courtney in April, distributing the photos of her, as well as breaching his orders to stay away from her mom, Lisa, because he showed up at the house. Um, there was also charges unrelated to Courtney. They were uh, had to do with dangerous driving, and I think there was a charge for like evading the police. But in the end, he um, pled guilty to those charges and told the judge, "You know, I'm I'm going to stay away from her." That was June fifth that he was ar- that he was arrested. June seventh, two days later, is when he gets out of prison. Um, seems like a pretty light slap on the wrist for what we just heard described. Like to me that like what he's done so far, beating her up, sending the photos, like in my mind, that's, you know, 10 years in prison. Yeah. It's, it's weird because like it's, it's his first, like the judge is like, this is your first kind of time um, to get two days in prison. Like, yeah. Yeah. He didn't steal from Walmart. Like this is some pretty, Dysfunctional, yeah. antisocial, harmful, red yeah, flag waving, cocaine, you know, physical abuse, uh, mm. harassment. Um, how do you only get two days, you know? Yeah, his dad isn't the judge either. So, in case anyone's thinking that, because it's like, yeah, it just yeah. seems it's it just seems crazy. But I find covering crime and d- digging into so many of these stories, especially looking back at how like warning signs and red flags and stuff are just nothing mm-hmm. happens. Like this is just another case where I don't, it, it just seems like the punishments should be so much harsher, but yeah, regardless, we'll move on. So it, that happens. He's all, he's released two days later. It's June 7th. He's released and the day he's released. Coincidentally, is the last day Courtney Lake is seen. So this is um this the timeline becomes important at this point. When he stood when Philip Smith stood before the judge says I will never see her again, you know, I'm guilty of those crimes and the judge lets him, you know, leaves him free. And Courtney throughout the day into the evening is when she disappears. We're going to hear Courtney's mom Lisa describe what's known about Courtney's activity that day. And now we're going to get back to Jason Pike. So Jason Pike is Courtney's child's father that we heard Lisa describe earlier. Courtney spent the time right before her disappearance with Jason Pike. So let's get Mm -hmm. into her whereabouts on June 7th. Okay. Uh, Well, Jason picked her up here. Well, he picked her up just down the road. Um, I'm saying around 2.30, quarter three, because uh, Oliver had swimming lessons at 3.30. Although they weren't together, um, the two of them always went to his swimming lessons, if he had t-ball or soccer or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, he picked her up, I'd say, around between quarter after two and quarter to three. Uh, They went on, like, as a happy family. I saw her getting in his van. Um, so she went to swimming practice and what do you know about from there, like what, where Courtney's whereabouts were from swimming practice on? Well, she was seen on a CCTV at an SO gas station in the middle of town. Uh, that was about within an hour after she left here. I'm saying between three and three thirty. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Jason Pike told me he had dropped her home here 
at five-ish this rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were gone, like I say, to that Lions Club barbecue. Now, we didn't leave home until about quarter after four, four thirty. And the reason we left so early was that Danny is on the, the barbecuing committee down there. So that's why we left early. So when she got back from swimming, uh, she phoned me. I was talking away to her and was around six. And then she called me back again. I'm saying it was around seven thirty ish. Um, and I said, Courtney, Mom got uh, barbecue chicken and ribs and salad and all kinds of desserts for you if you want them. She said, Oh, Mom, I'm starved. And I said, Well, bye, don't have a lot to eat. Like it's home because I got lots for you. Good, she said. You better hurry up. Very good. I will be. And we walked back into the house anytime, I'm going to say, 9 30 and quarter 10. Okay. And she wasn't here. And when did you, when did it become apparent that she was not just like ran to the store or something, that she was actually missing? When I first called her cell phone. Mm -hmm. Because the message always left on her phone is, Courtney, leave a message. And that night, between that evening when I couldn't get on her cell phone, which said, uh, Courtney, um, and just minutes, uh, before 8 o'clock, her message went from uh, Courtney, leave a message, to if this is Ryan, keep calling back. Huh. Uh, and it was yeah. Courtney's voice saying that? Oh, yes, it was her voice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so, yeah. so up until then, she had a regular voicemail, this is Courtney, yeah. leave a message, and she yeah. must have changed it that night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the police officers told me that her phone was turned off at around 8.12. They said, like, it didn't die. It was actually turned off. Taking all of those records from Kudo, right? Okay. Can, can, you, can you tell me about when and what led you to make the missing persons report? On July the 7th, she went missing. July the 8th, I went over, and me being mom and worried about her, I called uh, the RNC, and I said, I want to uh, file a missing person report, report. He said, what's the name of the missing person? And I said, Courtney Michelle Lake. He said, how long has she been missing? When did you see her last? I said, I last spoke to her around last night. I said, around 7, 7.30. He said, ma'am, we can't um, file a missing person report for 48 hours. Now, to me, my baby is gone. This is my daughter. This is my flesh. And I started on the phone. I said, I don't give it. Now, excuse my language, Jordan. I said, I do not give a fuck how long she has to be gone. I know she's gone. So anyway, he sent off this this officer, and he was really nice. It's a uh, constable hall. So anyway, he repeated the same message. He said, I will take your statement, but he said, usually we'll wait 40, 48 hours. I said, when you spend 25 years with your child, I said, you know the habits of them, every step they make. So, you know, I'll just kind of, we'll just kind of walk through what she just explained there. So again, that morning, Philip Smith pleads guilty to those to the series of offenses I talked about. He walks out of the courtroom early that afternoon. I think she said around two o'clock is Courtney, her son Oliver, and her ex Oliver's dad, Jason Pike. They're going to swimming lessons, which they would do as mm -hmm. kind of like a you know like as a family basically. So she goes off and does that in the afternoon. Um, Jason Pike claims he dropped her off at home. I think it was like around three thirty ish, four o'clock ish was the time that he, or no, I think it was more like four to five ish is when yeah. he claimed he dropped her off, and he took Oliver. So Oliver was spending the night with him, is my understanding. So he drops Courtney off at Lisa's house, Courtney's mom's house. Courtney's in the home uh, around seven seven thirty ish. Courtney, that's when Courtney and her mom talk and Lisa explained that, you know, I'm going to bring home a bunch of food for you, which, you know, that's awesome when your parents do that. Mm -hmm. um, and 
that is the last contact she has with her daughter. So around 7, 7.30, she says, I'll, you know, I'm going to bring a bunch of food home. And Courtney says, great. When she comes home a couple hours later, Courtney's not in the home. Um, she calls her how calls Courtney's phone, and that's what she hears. The voicemail had been changed, saying, "You know, if this is you, Ryan, which is Courtney's boyfriend at the time, the boyfriend she had mm-hmm. after Philip. If this is you, Ryan, keep calling back." So that is kind of initially what's known about her last day and her disappearance. So, as far as who is responsible and what's going on, as you can imagine. People are going to be questioning Philip Smith because of yeah. their rocky relationship. Yeah, that's where my mind goes. You know, almost immediately is is Philip. Yeah, so Phil, like their relationship's rocky, so it has all the signs of you know that problem. But at the same time, it's like these three guys are all people that I would be looking at. I asked Lisa what she thought was was going on. You know, when she after she went to the police and reported it. And she right. she didn't pull any punches. Here's here's what she said. When yeah, like within the first few days, like when you first reported her missing, like you knew her voicemail had changed that night. You couldn't find her. What was your first thought that was going on? Well, my first thought was um, because Courtney had told me and Mom here that you never guess what Jason said to me, and I said, "Well." Wants me to go over and have go out and have a sleepover with with Oliver. I said, "Don't do." And she knew by the look on my face. Don't worry, Mom. She said, "I'm not." But she said he wants to be a family again and stuff like this. So a few days after she was gone missing, Jason sent me a text message and he said, "How close are you to Bannerman Park?" And I said, "I'm not, but I can be." So he phoned me and he said, do you want to meet me at McDonald's on top of the road and have an ice cream or something with Oliver? And I said, sure, not a problem. I'll leave now. So anyway, we went in there and I had about uh, supper for Oliver. And uh, I said, Jason, what do you think happened to Courtney? Like I was trying to, I was prying him Mm -hmm. more than he knew I was prying him, right? And he said, Lisa, I really think she's just gone on a drug binge. I said, no, Jason, she's not gone on a drug binge. And to contact nobody. You know, I said, do you think she wouldn't contact Oliver in a week? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I said, oh, I do know. Because he looks forward to her phone calls. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he was, well, you know, we were thinking about patching things up and whatever. Well, I said, and on one side of my brain, I'm saying, oh, no, she wasn't. But on the other side of my brain, I was saying, well, why would she go on a drug binge if she wanted to straighten things up with you? Mm-hmm. So did, did you, like, yeah. after that meeting, you were you were suspicious of him, but did you go as far as to think he probably was involved? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she really made no secret about it. She was going after Jason Pike, basically, in this kind of like clandestine investigation. Like that story of meeting him for coffee, I I was kind of like had chills imagining like her daughter's missing. Yeah, like a week at this point, right? Yeah, and she's going with the guy who she thinks did it. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's an intense that's an intense meeting and and she still left it thinking like this he's involved. Like listening to this story, it really my mind doesn't go towards him at all. Yeah, and I don't know what his prior history was. My understanding is he did have some or does have some kind of criminal record, but I know like I followed this closely when it was all unfolding and he was front and center as like kind of like portrayed as a suspect even in the early reporting on this he did one of those things where um often when there's a missing persons case like people will like talk to the press and plead for information and whatnot i remember he did one he i don't know which news source um interviewed him but i remember watching it being like ooh, like you know that guy's kind of suspicious and there, yeah. there was you know it just seemed odd but Lisa, Courtney's mom, she, just as you heard, like, there was something about him that made her think he was involved. I I don't know what she, she saw that led her to think that. And Yeah, it seems weird that he would meet up with her if he was involved. Yeah, but then at the same time, maybe he would do that to be like, 
you know, to show that he wasn't involved. I, I can't even see it being that thought through. By yeah. Him. Like, oh, well, I'm going to really, you know, cast cast doubt on, on my guilt because I'm going to meet up with her at McDonald's. Yeah, no, it's it's true. But regardless, we have Philip Smith who just got out of prison or got out of jail or whatever for abusing her and the intimate photos the morning she was last seen. Her ex who wanted to get back with her, that was the last person known to be with her. So we have him. And then, of course, we should mention her new boyfriend, a guy named Ryan. Um, I asked Lisa her thoughts, and she was quick to shoot it down, the idea of him being involved. But at the same time, who claimed Ryan was responsible and who claimed so publicly was Philip Smith. Mm, so okay. he was – you'll hear Lisa explain. So let, let's, get, let's get into it. Okay. So when, when the, the, um, the news of Courtney's disappearance had began to spread around, um, right away he plastered all over Facebook that Ryan, Ryan killed Courtney some way, shape, or form. Now, Ryan, I'll go back to St. Lawrence now because I, we lived out there for 11 years. I mean, I was married to her father, Victor. We're in here now since uh, July of 2000. Now, uh, Ryan's dad is Courtney's godfather. So mm. as you can tell, his mom and dad were very close with mm. myself and my ex-husband. So I said, if Ryan was on the list of people that would hurt Courtney, he'd be my last shot. Mm. So despite Philip Smith on Facebook saying, you know, Ryan is responsible, um, Lisa didn't seem very swayed by that. It seems like she, mm -hmm. there was some kind of family connection as she described. And she, uh, yeah, saw no, didn't seem suspicious of him at all. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, um, their relationship, Courtney and Ryan, I don't know a lot about it, but it seemed pretty wholesome. As I mentioned earlier, Courtney's Facebook profile is still there as kind of like a time capsule of these last Part, this, these last known parts of her life and she has a lot of photos of her and Ryan like fishing and out on the water doing different things like it seemed like that was maybe a healthier relationship than what she had prior but um, and maybe Lisa saw that and that was a part of the reason she didn't suspect anything but these three people are kind of the names early on that were that were most connected with what may have happened to her. That's where I would start if I were investigating this disappearance slash murder. I would start with um, I don't know if I'd start with Philip, but I'd definitely start with uh, her son's father. And yeah, I would definitely, definitely the new guy. Yeah, it's just like Philip got out of prison, like out of jail that morning. So it's it would be pretty bold for him to be involved in some way. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, these are three kind of cards on the table that need to be looked at. And that's, and still at this point, like we know early on in this, in, in what we're listening to tonight, Lisa had said, my daughter's missing and murdered. At this point, it's still a missing person's case. It's only been, like what we're hearing about is kind of the early days after Courtney's disappearance. So yeah, and it was a week that she went to coffee with. Uh, yeah, so J yeah, with Jason Pike. So it's yeah, we're very fresh into it, and honestly, there is a ton more to this story. So w when I was putting this together, I I kind of hoped we could do it in one episode, but I really I knew it wasn't going to happen. So. This is a good spot to start because really what we've got through so far is we have a really good introduction to the people involved, the dynamics of the relationships leading up to the disappearance of Courtney. In the next episode, we'll we'll follow through. So we know the basics of her of her whereabouts on June seventh. What we'll hear in the next episode is what the the blanks that the police were able to fill in. So. Shortly after her disappearance, about within you know the month of June 2017, so much has will happen. Uh, a lot more details will come out about what happened that day. 
and it'll and they'll come out in very surprising ways. Uh, this case has a lot of coincidences and a lot of just strange roads that we're gonna go on. So that'll be in the next episode. So at this point. Well, this is a crazy story already. Yeah, I mean, you have three solid suspects, I think, and you know, it's 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 going to be interesting to see where the timeline goes. Yeah, and it's it's hard. It's hard to hear the story of a young woman suffering with addiction that's being abused by at least two men because her mm-hmm. mom said that Jason Pike there was some physical violence there. There definitely was with Philip Smith. He pled guilty to charging. Like, it just seems like we heard her life start off as yeah. promising and had all this stuff happening that sounded great. And, you know, everyone close to her loved her. Yet her relationships and addiction seemed to just be pulling her down. And yeah, and it's it's going to pull her down pretty low as well here in the next episode which is going to be hard to get through but it's a story that needs to be told yeah i agree i want to thank you for joining aaron and i in our discussion surrounding the disappearance and murder of courtney lake As we mentioned in this episode, the story will be continued on the next episode of Nighttime, and it's going to be released shortly. So with that, we'll end this episode of Nighttime. But before we part, I want to end with thanks. First, a huge thank you to Lisa Lake for taking the time to share her family's heartbreaking story with us. Lisa, your telling of the twists and turns in this story must have taken unimaginable strength. I hope in doing so, you and Courtney have found many new advocates among listeners of this show. Saying that, I want to encourage any listeners of Nighttime to join the Help Us Find Courtney Facebook group. I've added a link in the show notes. As well, if anyone listening has information that may help find Courtney, please contact the RNC at 709-729-8000. Next, In wrapping up this episode, I want to give a big thanks to the Canadian bands Vox Somnia and Paragon Cause who provide the musical themes for nighttime. And lastly, but most importantly, a huge thank you to all the listeners. Without you, this show would have seen the light of day many moons ago. If you want more nighttime, let me suggest the premium feed. For about the price of a cup of coffee, you can access a separate feed in which the episodes are posted earlier than they are here in the free feed and are done so without paid advertising. But beyond the regular episodes, the premium feed also includes the Nightcap After Show episodes in which I and a guest will climb a bit further down the rabbit holes. You can access the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, let me thank the newest members to the group. Stephanie, Suzanne, Kaylee, Emma, Donna, Holly, Hellcat, and Harrison. Thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by telling your friends about me and by leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whichever equivalent you use. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities, on or off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'm using the handle at Nighttime Pod. And if you have any story ideas or want to give feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at nighttimepodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and stay safe out there. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte. Listeners, are you looking for something to listen to while you wait for the next episode of Nighttime? Check out this great podcast. Hello everyone, this is Robin Warder, host of the true crime podcast, The Trail Went Cold. If you grew up watching the classic television show Unsolved Mysteries, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I profile a new unsolved murder or missing persons case and share all the baffling details. Afterward... I provide my own personal analysis 
and theories about what might have happened. This is a show for true crime buffs who are fascinated by cold cases and love to discuss them and pick them apart in an attempt to figure out the truth. So be sure to check out our podcast to learn about some truly bizarre unsolved mysteries where the trail went cold. Mm -hmm.